Coming up next, we will celebrate Darwin's 200th birthday and talk about the flying spaghetti monster, because I like my evolution reporting with a side of carbs. In London today, they threw a big party at the Natural History Museum to commemorate Charles Darwin's birthday. Men in beards got in for free. It was just one of some 600 Darwin celebrations around the world. No special treatment for men with beards around here, sorry. But we are commemorating Darwin's day. Darwin's pesky theories of evolution continue to make for contentious political arguments here in this country. In 2005, you'll recall the Kansas State School Board made national news for its decision to teach intelligent design alongside evolution in public school science classes. That debate spawned a third theory to explain why things are the way they are. It was the doctrine of the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. The theory, the religious belief that a big spaghetti monster and he alone created mountains and trees and, I'm sorry, I'm quoting from scripture here, a quote, midget. The monster made the trees and the mountains and the midget. Uh, the guy who brought this religion to light uh, was a man named Bobby Henderson, then a 25-year-old student at Oregon State University. In a letter to the Kansas School Board, he insisted that if intelligent design was to be made a part of the curriculum, then the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster had to be there too. He said, quote, we have evidence that a flying spaghetti monster created the universe. None of us, of course, were around to see it, but we have written accounts of it. Henderson also gave specific instructions on how his church's beliefs were to be taught in schools. He said it is disrespectful to teach our beliefs without wearing his chosen outfit, which of course is full pirate regalia. Mr. Henderson even offered an explanation for some of the woes that afflict mankind. Global warming, earthquakes, hurricanes, and other natural disasters are a direct effect of the shrinking numbers of pirates since the 1800s. It's all very funny as satire, of course, but as good satire is, it was also a sort of perfectly brilliant challenge to the notion that if you are going to say science doesn't matter, science is not more valuable than religion, science is not more provable than religion, science is just one belief among many, if you're going to say that religion has to be taught alongside science, then who can judge what counts as worthy religion? The whole spaghetti monster theory sort of caught on. Just last year, siblings in Tennessee built this statue of the flying spaghetti monster and got permission to put it in front of a courthouse in a free speech zone alongside a statue of Jesus and Moses and some chainsaw carved bears like the ones I have in my yard. What's the reason to bring up the spaghetti monster today, other than the fact that I like pasta along with my evolutionary discussion? Well, the new Gallup poll shows that... 39% of Americans say they, quote, believe in the theory of evolution. A quarter say they do not believe in it, and 36% they do not. 36% say they do not have an opinion. What would Charles Darwin think of all this? Joining us now is Edward Larson, professor of history and law at Pepperdine University. He won the Pulitzer Prize for Summer for the Gods, the Scopes Trial, and America's continuing debate over science and religion. Professor Larson, it's a real pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me on. From your own research, what do you make of Americans' widespread resistance to, uh, to a belief in evolution? Well, this has been true all along. As long as they've been doing polls, the results come about, about this way. About 40% of the people believe in evolution, and the rest have their doubts. And those doubts rest squarely on religion. It comes from a couple different sources. Uh, one source is the, the literal reading of the Genesis account, which talks about God creating the earth and all the animals, all the different kinds, and doing it in six days. And so if you want to take a literal reading of the Bible, the evolutionary account contradicts it. But then even a, a broader extent, people wonder that if, you're, if it's going to be all chance and all Darwin, then uh, you know, it, it questions a person's worth. So w people perceive it that way. So if they hear from their churches and their ministers and the books they read written by creation scientists or, or some intelligent design people, that evolution has its faults and it undercuts religion. Well, if they're given, if people are given the choice between God or Darwin, most of them will choose God. 
In terms of efforts to debunk Darwin or to rebut Darwin, um, I'm familiar with those existing efforts right now, but your research shows that that's, there have been aggressive efforts and organized efforts to rebut Darwin ever since Darwin was around. Is there anything that's different about the character yeah. of them now? No, it's just, it's just we're redoing the same thing. We have the same anxieties about them. Well, the anxieties are basically the same, but if anything, there's a growing uh, fundamentalist impulse in America. So if you go back, the complaints were more that this undercuts the meaning of humanity, and there was an attachment to the Genesis story of, of Adam and Eve, and that Adam and Eve were created, but there was general acceptance that the earth was very old. Now there's a growing interest reflected in that quarter or more that reject evolution, that they don't just reject the, uh, the, uh, the, um, that humans evolved, they reject the whole kit and caboodle, and they, um, they believe that the earth was literally created in six days. So actually there's a narrowing in the sense that more people are holding to a literalistic belief in the Bible than in the past. Wow. What do you think that Darwin would make of this debate? The, the, I would think of it as the devolution of this debate, but that's probably loaded. <laughs> Darwin would understand it. He knew his ideas were very controversial from a religious point of view. That's why he waited so long to publish it. He came up with the idea 20 years before he published it, and he worked 20 years to, to perfect it. Not only did he try to perfect it, but he was dealing with a sort of a dispute at home because his wife was, a, was an evangelical Christian, was a very conservative Christian, and he loved her dearly. And he didn't want to... He, did, he, he, he feared... Um, contradicting her or, or undermining her or making her feel bad mm -hmm. and so he held back for a long time out of respect for her so he knew firsthand the sort of from his own family and from the people around him the sort of opposition this would raise and um, that's why he tried to get his powder dry and 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 present it clearly he knew it would face religious opposition he was opposed by his early teachers like Adam Sedgwick uh, 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 his, one of his geology teachers <laughs> they were there was concern right away. So he knew there was concern. He knew it would take a long time. Just let, think. It took Copernicus 300 years before the, the church dropped its ban on Copernican theory of, of uh, that the, the earth goes around the sun. And so I think Darwin knew this was in for the long haul. Edward Larson, professor of law and history at Pepperdine University. Thanks very much for your time tonight. Happy Darwin Day. Well, thank you. It's been a great day. <laughs> thank you. Coming